Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me here today. Um, this is our 14th town hall that we have started um, since this pandemic really shattered and, and has really shaken up our lives over the last four months. Um, I wanna thank you for joining me. Uh, my team, I wanna thank my team, my incredible staff who worked really hard to make sure that every week we could provide you with really timely, important information from leaders in our community here in Cambridge and around the state to answer really important questions as we are all trying to figure out what it means to live safely um, in a pandemic while also grieving and holding each other um, in ways that um, don't feel normal uh, in the loss of life and the loss of life as we've known it. So those of you who have joined me um, every week, thank you. We're gonna take a brief hiatus from this town hall over the next month so we can focus on the state budget. And today for our last one before the hiatus, I am joined by some amazing community leaders. Many of you watching this will recognize um, the, incredible, the incredible group of people here. I have uh, folks from uh, uh, incredible people from our, our fire department, from our, our mayor's office, our Congresswoman Catherine Clark. We have many former mayors who I'm joined by, school committee members, our police commissioner, um, and just really just uh, some young, amazing people in our community. I wanna say thank you to all of you for the work that you do every day in really making sure that Cambridge and our community is a place that um, builds resilience and also um, faces our truths and holds us accountable to make us a better community. I think the moment that we're in today shows us the inequities in our society. From the fact that black and brown immigrants and low income communities have been disproportionately hit by the COVID-19 pandemic to the current social upheaval and what is seemingly and maybe finally a collective anger and acknowledgement and determination that black lives do matter. We are dominated by governing systems that historically through today have shown a great disparity and injustice when applied to people of color immigrants and people living in poverty, as seen in our rule of law, healthcare outcomes, and the climate, just a few to name. Educational resources, financial security, and investments have been founded on documents like the Declaration of Independence that were never meant to expand liberty, prosperity, freedom for everyone, yet, to serve, yet served to secure those ideals for white men at that time, while deliberately excluding African-Americans and indigenous people. As W.E.B. Dubois wrote in 1925, if on the other hand, we are going to use history for our pleasure, for, inflate, for inflating our national ego and giving us a false but pleasurable sense of accomplishment, then we must give up the idea of history as a science or as an art. Admit frankly, we are using a version of history, of historic fact, in order to influence and educate the new generation along the way we wish. This is our moment of reckoning that while many great leaders have found inspiration to push our collective sense of selves and our nation, um, to, to, that we have acknowledged that we have fallen short of what this document has promised. We have fallen short for the last 400 years in failing to recognize and redress the systemic checks and balances that were never in place to root up white supremacy or economic insecurity. Our attempts to chip away have never been enough. And today, a new generation is rising and responding to this call by igniting our imaginations, inspiring emerging leaders, and calls for change and accountability. I wanna thank all of those in our community, many who've joined me as guest readers, and many others who are speaking truth to power and courageously calling for a society that would never assume or wish the worst fatalities, pain and suffering of a pandemic, climate change or economic insecurity disproportionately on any group in our society. And with that, I wanna thank our readers again, and we will start with our Declaration of Independence with a response by Frederick Douglass's speech, What to the Slave is the 4th of July. Thank you for joining us today. In Congress, July 4, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, 
a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare these causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such a form as to them shall seem most likely to secure, to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies. And such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former system of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injustices and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such disillusions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction born to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on inhabitants in these states, 
for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for our pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in the neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it as once an example and a fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws and altering fundamentally the forms of our government. For suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with the power to legislate for us in the case whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coast, burnt our towns and destroyed our lives and our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of debt, desolation and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and proceeds of sexually paralyzed in the most barbarous ages, the totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose characteristic is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Now have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their, by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, uh, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, con contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. I will now read What to the Slave is the 4th of July. July 5th, 1852. Mr. President, friends and fellow citizens, the task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. 
I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is, consider is considerable. And the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I'm here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. This for the purpose of this celebration is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This to you is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your natural, national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I am glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. You are, even now, only in the beginning of your national career, still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad this is so. There's hope in the thought, and hope is much needed under the dark clouds which lower above the horizon. Good afternoon. Fellow citizens, 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. The style and title of your sovereign people in which you now glory was not then born. You were under the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government as the home government. England as the fatherland, although a considerable distance from your home imposed in the exercise of its parental prerogatives upon its colonial children. Such restraints, burdens, and limitations as its mature judgment, it deemed wise and right and proper. But your fathers, who had not adopted the idea of infallibility of government and the absolute character of its acts, presumed to differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and the justice of some of those burdens and restraints. They went so far as to pronounce the measures of government unjust, unreasonable, and, un and progressive, unprogressive, I'm sorry, oppressive, excuse me. And altogether, such as ought not to be quietly submitted to, I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. Feeling themselves harshly and unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They positioned, they petitioned and remonstrated. They did so in a decorous, respectful, and loyal manner. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn, yet they persevered. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of a total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It was a startling idea, much more so than we, at this distance of time, regard it. The timid and the prudent of that day were, of course, shocked and alarmed by it. Their opposition to the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful, but amid all their terror and affrighted vociferations against it, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on and the country with it. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshipers of property, 
clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of national sanction. They did so in the form of a resolution. We seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day whose transparency is at all equal to it. Resolved that these United Colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded, and today you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you therefore may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history. The very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and to hold it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes and at whatever cost. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots and heroes, and for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. They love their country better than their own private interests. And all will concede that it is rare, a rare virtue that ought to command respect. He who will intelligently lay down his life for his country is a man whom it is not human nature to despise. Your fathers stake their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor on the cause of their country. In admiration of liberty, they lost sight of all other interests. They were peace men, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. They showed forbearance, but they knew its limits. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. You may well cherish the memory of such men. They were great in their day and their generation. Their solid manhood stands out the more as we contrast it with these denigrated times. How circumspect, exact, and proportionate were all their movements. How unlike the politicians of an hour, their statesmanship looked beyond the passing moment and stretched away in strength into the distant future. Mark them, fully appreciating the hardship to be encountered, firmly believing in the right of their cause, wisely measuring the terrible odds against them. Your fathers, the fathers of this Republic, laid the cornerstone of national superstructure, which has risen still and rises in grandeur around you. Of this fundamental work, this day is the anniversary. Our eyes are met with demonstrations of joyous enthusiasm. The causes which led to the separation of the colonies from the British crown have never lacked for a tongue. They have all been taught in your common schools, narrated at your firesides, unfolded from your pulpits, and thundered from your legislative halls, and are as familiar to you as household words. They form the staple of your national poetry and eloquence. I leave, therefore, the great deeds of your fathers to others. My business, if I have any here today, is with the present. The accepted time with God and his cause is the ever living now. We have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future. Now is the time, the important time. Your fathers have lived, died, and have done their work and have done much of it well. You live and must die and you must do your work. You have no right to enjoy a child's share in the labor of your fathers unless your children are to be blessed by your labors. You have no right to wear out and waste the hard-earned fame of your fathers to cover your indolence. Fellow citizens, pardon me, allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? 
are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would to God, both for your sake and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful, but such is not the state of the case. I say it with the sad sense of the disparity between us. I'm not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems or in human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean citizens to mock me by asking me to speak today? Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains heavy and grievous yesterday are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day from the slave's point of view, standing here, identified with the American bondman, marking his wrongs, mine. I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation has never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to the false to the future. Standing with God and crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce with all the emphasis I can command everything that served to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. I fancy I hear some of my audience say, it is just in the circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit, where is all the plain? There is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do the people of this country need light? Must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? The slaveholders themselves acknowledge in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which if committed by a black man, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the same like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidden under severe fines and penalties. The teaching of the slave to read or to write when you can point to any such laws in reference to the beast of the field. 
then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls in the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from the brute, then will I argue with you that the slave is a man. Is it not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding the sheep and the cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's gods and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave. We are called upon to prove that we are men. What then remains to be art? Oh, excuse me. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? That he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty, involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice hard to be understood? How should I look today in the presence of Americans to show that men have a natural right to freedom? To do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What if I'm to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I will have I have better employments for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine, that God did not establish it, that our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There's blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? I cannot. The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability, and could I reach the nation's ear, I would, today, pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced.
doing that? What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he has been constant victim. To him, your celebration is a shame. Your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, and all of your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes that would disgrace a nation of savages. This is not a nation, there, there is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking, bloody, that are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through the monarchies and despotisms of the world, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by and side of the everyday practices of this nation and you will say to me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without right. Take the American slave trade, which we are told by the papers is especially prosperous just now, as the price of men was never higher and which is carried on in all the large towns and cities in one half of this confederacy. This trade is one of the peculiarities of American institutions. In several states, this trade is a chief source of wealth. It is called the internal slave trade in order to divert from the horror with which the foreign slave trade is contemplated. The foreign slave trade has long since been denounced by this government as piracy, as an inexorable traffic. To arrest it, the nation keeps a squadron at immense cost on the coast of Africa. Everywhere in this country, it is safe to speak of this foreign slave trade as a most inhuman traffic, opposed alike to the laws of God and of man. It is, however, a notable fact that while so much extrication is poured out by Americans upon those engaged in the foreign slave trade, the men engaged in the slave trade between the states pass without condemnation and their business is deemed honorable. Behold the practical operation of this internal slave trade, the American slave trade, sustained by American politics and American religion. Here you will see men and women reared like swine for the market. You know what is a swine drover? I will show you a swine drover. They inhabit all our southern states. They permeate the country and crowd the highways of the nation. With droves of human stock, you will see one of these human flesh jobbers, armed with a pistol, whip, and bowie knife, driving a company of a hundred men, women, and children from the Potomac to the slave market at New Orleans. These wretched people are to be sold singly or in lots to soup purchasers. They are food for the cotton fields and deadly for the sugar mill. Mark the sad procession as it moves wearily along and the inhumane wretch who drives them. Hear his savage yells and his blood chilling oaths as he hurries on his affrighted captives. There, see the old man with his locks thinned and gray. Cast one glance, if you please, upon that young mother whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun, her briny tears falling on the brow of the babe in her arms. See, too, that girl of 13 weeping 
yes, weeping, as she thinks of the comfort from whom, of the mother whom she had been torn. The drove moves tardily. Heat and sorrow have nearly consumed their strength. Suddenly, you hear a quick snap, like the discharge of a rifle. The fetters clank and the chain rattles simultaneously. Your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way to the center of your soul. The crack you heard was the sound of the slave whip. The scream you heard was from the woman you saw with her babe. Her speed had faltered under the weight of her child and her chains. That gash on her shoulder tells her to move on. Follow this drove to New Orleans, attend the auction, see men examined like horses, see the forms of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. See this drove sold and separated forever and never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from the scattered multitude. Tell me citizens, where under the sun you can witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking. Yet this is but a glance of the American slave trade as it exists at this moment in the ruling part of the United States. I was born amid such sights and scenes. To me, the American slave trade is a terrible reality. The fleshmongers gather up their victims by dozens and drive them chained to the General Depot of Baltimore. When a sufficient number has been collected here, a ship is chartered for the purpose of conveying the forlorn crew to Mobile or to New Orleans. From the slave prison to the ship, they are usually driven in the darkness of night. In the deep, still darkness of midnight, I have been often aroused by the dead, heavy footsteps and the piteous cries of the chained gangs that passed our door. Fellow citizens, this murderous traffic is today an active operation in this boastful republic. In the solitude of my spirit, I see clouds of dust raised on the highways of the South. I see the bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful weight of fettered humanity on the way to the slave markets where the victims are to be sold like horses, sheep, and swine knocked off at the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest ties, ruthless, broken to gratify the lust, caprice and rep <laughs> to the buyers and the sellers of men. My soul sickens in the sight, but a, uh, but a still more inhumane disgrace and scandalous state of things remains to be presented by an act of an American Congress, not yet two years old. Slavery has been naturalized in its most horrible and revolting form. Mason and Dixon line has been obliterated New York has become as Virginia, and the power to hold, hunt, and sell men, women, and children as slaves remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is coextensive with the Star Spangled Banner and American Christianity. Where these go may also go the merciless slave hunter. Where these are, man is not sacred. He is a bird for the sportsman's gun. By that most foul and fiendish of all human decrees, the liberty and person of every man are put in peril. Your broad Republican domain is hunting ground for men. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. Your president, your secretary of state in force, as a duty you owe to your free and glorious country and to your God that you do this accursed thing. Not fewer than 40 Americans have within the past two years been hunted down and without a moment's warning hurried away in chains and consigned to slavery and excruciating torture. Some of these have had wives and children. 
dependent on them for bread. But of this, no account was made. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to the right of marriage and to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included. For black men, there is neither law nor justice, humanity nor religion. The fugitive slave law makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judges who tries them. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery and five when he fails to do so. The oath of any two villains is sufficient under this hell black enactment to send the most pious and exemplary black men into the remorseless jaws of slavery. His own testimony is nothing. He can bring no witnesses for himself. The minister of American justice is bound by the law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let this damning fact be perpetual, told, perpetually told. Let it be thundered around the world that in tyrant killing, king hating, people loving, democratic Christian America, the seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and palatable bribe and are bound in deciding the cases of a man's liberty to hear only his accusers. In glaring violation of justice, in shameless disregard of the forms of administering law, in cunning arrangement to entrap the defenseless, and in diabolical intent, this fugitive slave law stands alone in the annals of tyrannical legislation. Americans, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flagrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three million of your countrymen. You hurl your anthem at the crowded, crowned headed tyrants of Russia and Austria and pride yourself on your democratic institutions while you, while you yourselves consent to be the mere tools and bodyguards of the tyrants of Virginia and Carolina. You invite to your shores fugitives of oppressions from abroad, honor them with banquets, greet them with ovations, cheer them, toast them, Salute them, protect them, and pour out your money to them like water. But the fugitives from your own land you advertise, hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. Your glory in your refinement, your universal education, yet you maintain a system as barbarous and dreadful as ever stained the character of a nation, a system begun in avarice, supported in pride, and perpetuated in cruelty. You shed tears over fallen hungry and make the sad story of her wrongs the theme of your poets, statesmen and orators, till your gallant sons are ready to fly to arms to vindicate her cause against the oppressor. But in regard to the 10,000 wrongs of the American slave, you would enforce the strictest silence and would hail him as an enemy of the nation who dares to make those wrongs the subject of public discourse. You are all on fire at the mention of liberty for France for Ireland, but are as cold as an iceberg at the thought of liberty for the enslaved of America. You discourse eloquently on dignity of labor, yet you sustain a system which in its very essence casts a stigma upon labor. You can bear your bosom to the storm of British artillery to throw off three penny on tea and yet bring the last hard earned farthing from the grasp of the black laborers of your country. You profess to believe that of one blood, God made all nations of men to dwell on the face of all the earth and hath commanded all men everywhere to love one another. Yet you notoriously hate and glory in your hatred all men whose skins are not colored like your own. You declare before the world and are understood by the world to declare that you hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. And yet 
you hold securely in a bondage which, according to your own Thomas Jefferson, is worse than the ages of which your father rose in rebellion to oppose, a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further your national inconsistencies. The, exist the existence of slavery in this country brands your Republicans as a sham, your humanity as base pretense, your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It slaps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a word to be mocking to a mocking earth. It is antagonistic. It is an, the antagonistic force in your government. The only thing that seriously disturbs and endangers your union. It fetters your progress. It is the enemy of improvement. The deadly foe of education. It fosters prides. It breeds insolvence. It promotes vice. It shelters crime. It is a curse to the earth that supports it, and yet you cling to it as if it were the sheet anchor of all your hopes. Be warned, a horrible reptile is coiled up in your nation's bosom. A venomous creature is nursing the tender breast of your young republic. For love of God, tear away, fling from your hideous monster, let the weight of 20 million crush and destroy it forever. But it is answered in reply to all this, that precisely what I have now denounced is, in fact, guaranteed and sanctioned by the Constitution of the United States, that the right to hold and to haunt slaves is a part of that Constitution framed by the illustrious fathers of this republic. Then, I dare to affirm, notwithstanding all I have said before, your fathers, instead of being the honest men I have before declared them to be, were the various impostors that ever practiced on mankind. This is the inevitable conclusion, and from it there is no escape. But I differ from those who charge this baseness on the framers of the Constitution of the United States. It is a slander upon their memory, at least so I believe. And others have, as I think, fully and clearly vindicated the Constitution from any design to support slavery for an hour. Allow me to say, in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented to of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. I therefore leave off where I began with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not, do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did ages ago. No nation can shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot round in the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time was when such could be done, but a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arm of commerce has borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are distinctly heard on the other. In the fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison, I say, and let every heart join in saying it, all God speed the day when human blood shall cease to flow. In every clime be understood the claims of human brotherhood, and each return for evil good, not blow for blow. That day will come all feuds to end and change into a faithful friend each foe. I wanna thank all of my invited readers. This was an amazing, uh, an amazing reading and I found it to be very powerful and a moving reminder of where we are, where we've come from and where we need to be. With that, I would actually, I, I am no substitute, but I, I did jump in for our district attorney, Rachel Rollins, who is also homegrown Cambridge. Um, and with that, I, I'm so grateful. I feel like she embodies so much of what we've just read, her incredible intellect, her spirit, her determination of demanding accountability for the world that is worthy of all of us. Uh, 
District Attorney Rollins, thank you for joining us. And, and I give this to you before we say goodbye. Perfect. Well, thank you, Representative. And Victoria is just eating Tic Tacs in the back of my car. So um, I, I think it's really telling that today, I earlier today, I announced with Lee Merritt, who's one of the best uh, civil rights lawyers in the United States, he along with Benjamin Crump represent many of the families um, that have unfortunately been seared in our brains, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, um, in their quest for um, civil responsibility um, on behalf of the murders of their loved ones. Obviously, people have to look to the government, the district attorneys overwhelmingly, to charge police officers when they engage in this um, heinous and violent and murderous behavior. Not all of them, but the some that we've seen lately. Um, and this morning, we announced uh, that three locations in the United States have been selected of the approximately 2,200 district attorneys in the United States, three of us were just selected for a Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission. And Boston is gonna be one of them. And although we know Cambridge is not part of Boston, um, I defy any of you on this call that are over the age of 45 or so um, to say you don't know what busing is. I defy any of you on this call that are over the age of 45 or so to say you don't know what the Charles Stewart murders were about. And um, of course, for the younger people on the call, Charles Stewart uh, murdered his pregnant wife um, after going to a birthing class um, and driving home through Mission Hill because he was at Beth Israel Hospital, I believe, um, or Brigham and Women's, a B hospital. But, um, knew his audience and told the police that a black man, a fictitious, of course, black man, but a black man had murdered his pregnant wife and the Boston police rained hell down upon Mission Hill and Roxbury. And not only William Bennett, who was falsely um, plastered all over the Herald and the Globe and looked at as the villain and the murderous um, double, uh, double murderer, in fact, Charles's lie unraveled and the coward that he is, he jumped to his death. Um, only shortly thereafter, we found out he had killed Carol and their child, Christopher was born and 17 days later died. So that domestic violence, double homicide is, is seeping in racism. And what we're seeing today is even though we need to talk about George Floyd, the United States of America has never reckoned or atoned for our egregious start. And I'm not even talking about black people, I'm talking about indigenous people. And we have to, like a South Africa, like a Germany, like a Guatemala, even like a Canada, and we've seen certain places within the United States, we need to reckon and atone. And I am so humbled and honored that I'm gonna be assembling um, community, which is the most important part, to start that hard and long conversation toward healing. We have a lot of work to do. And even though maybe some of you guys don't technically live in Boston, you will be receiving calls from me for input or involvement and in how we are gonna do the hard work of trying to get this right. Um, and even though I'm the DA of Suffolk County, which is Boston, Chelsea, Winthrop and Revere, I am a Cambridge girl through and through. My family still lives on Clarendon Avenue, um, born on Howard, moved to Franklin, raised on Clarendon um, all the time. So continue leading Cambridge, please. Um, continue showing the rest of our state what unity looks like, what diversity looks like, what inclusion looks like. We have an exceptional um, Cambridge City Council. I think I saw, yes, I see. I was in our Cambridge City Council president right there. Um, so we are really lucky and should be leading this Commonwealth and showing them what inclusion looks like. Do we have work to do? Of course we do. But I can tell you, when my parents got married in 1970, um, they left Boston because it was too hard for a white Irish man and his black uh, West Indian wife to live there. And they moved to Cambridge. Um, and it was not easy, but it was certainly easier than when they were in Boston. Let's continue leading our Commonwealth and our nation and showing them how this is done. Thank you. Thank you, District Attorney Rachel Rollins. Thank you for what you do in this world. I wanna say thank you to all of you on this call. For me, all of you are leaders 
who every day are demanding the best of each of us, holding our systems accountable, and really working hard to make sure that we are creating not just a society or a community, but that we're creating laws and budgets and regulations that hold us accountable and also build resilience um, and, and really build a vision for the kind of world, one that really is worthy of all of us. My love goes out to all of you, my gratitude to all of you. Thank you to CCTV. Thank you to my incredible staff. Thank you to the Cambridge community who've been on this town hall journey with me for the last 14 weeks. I will be back uh, before the school year opens. I am here every day though, working on behalf of you, working on behalf of the people of the Commonwealth. Um, and we, we will keep going. Reach out if you have questions, if you have needs. This is a marathon that we are in this together, um, but we also know that some of us are suffering more disproportionately. And it's our job to address that in these moments. So with that, I thank you all for who you are in this world. Bye.